yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm gonna do a poem about my dad. So yeah, we'll just, we'll just keep it. We'll keep it going. So father poems, and this is one of two that I have for my dad. This is called uh, Legacies. My father's vocabulary is quite extensive, but he still can't find the words for I love you, nor the synonyms, the acronyms, or abbreviations. I guess this is why I am a poet. I've inherited the words lost to his dictionary. I am the next volume updated. I am the new testament. So, um, talking about experimental poetry and spoken word, and um, when I think of that, and I think of the relationship with with Washington D.C., the, the words that come up to me are are I'd say community and communities because I do believe, especially with D.C., and I moved out here in 2001 to attend uh, American University, where with with Natalie, and I was taught by um, the amazing Myra Saru, so I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, and thank you. Um, but I think about the one thing I found out when I moved here, because I came from Charlotte, North Carolina, where we had like a really small, but just getting started, like poetry community, and it was pretty much like little things that would pop up, and it would go for a while, and then kind of fade away, and something else would pop up, started by a handful of people there, and then it would go for a while, and then it would fade away again. But uh, when I got to D.C. and I was looking for, you know, various places to go to like hear poetry and to read poetry and share my poems, I remember people saying, "Dude, you can find uh, poetry every night of the week in D.C. It can it can happen. Trust me. Wherever you want to go, you can you can find it." But what I also saw within the time was, even though I found different places to go to, there was a point where I realized I had to expand you know, my gaze and expand, you know, my ear about what I was listening to. So I could go to several different venues, but I'd see a lot of the same people there, and sometimes sharing the same poems. And then I would go to like, like other readings and such, like without, outside of the, of like the U Street Adams Morgan readings that I was attending. And I would go to different readings, see the same people, and some of them reading the same poems. So what I realized was all the people, like, oh, yeah, DC has a very, um, very, very like, you know, variety of like communities and everything. I said, yeah, there's a, there are a lot of poetry communities, but at the same time, I still feel like they were like segmented. So it was kind of like, yes, there's all like there's all these wonderful spices and foods that you can get your hands on, but you have to go to several different restaurants. It's not really going to be like uh, one place where like, yeah, try a little of this, try a little of that. And so um, when I always think of of you know poetry and, and experimentation and community, I always think of like uh, inclusiveness. And that's also what brought me to D.C. And I, I have to thank uh, Ethelbert because um, even before I moved to D.C., I, I was working for a newspaper and I, and I was reviewing, um, reviewing his, reviewing his, his book, uh, the, the memoir, the first, the, not not fifth inning, but I won't, but yes. Um, and so I remember asking about D.C. and just about you know what about D.C. is great. So I was thinking about getting the thing. He said D.C. is a great place to be a writer. I said okay. So when I, I was like, great, I've heard that. So and I and I visited AU and met with a lot of folks and um, uh, the one person I didn't get to meet was was uh, uh, Keith Leonard, and so I kind of talked back and forth with him. And then later, uh, when I got into the MFA program, and I asked him, uh, you know, what should I do while I'm here? He said, look, he said, when you're in an MFA program, he said, you'll have that community there. He said, but don't solely don't solely make, don't solely think the MFA is your only community. The city where you are, find your, find your community there as well. And that is going to make you like a better writer. And so, as I headed out, I had so many questions. And one of the first places that I went to, um, well, two or three places I went to, two of my classmates was, uh, was, was Venus Thrash and uh, Ebony Golden. And so, Venus, having lived in DC for a while, was showing me some different places. And Ebony Golden, being from Texas, we were both like, we got to find places to go. And um, so I'm just going to run down a list of the places that I started going to, like in 2001 and, and, and so on. And um, so there was, okay, I have to add this element in. There's this website called OK Player, which is a fan site for The Roots, if you've heard of the hip-hop group called The Roots. And it was like an online community. And I used to go on there and post little poems and haikus and stuff. And I kept hearing, and people had screen names. And so I kept seeing these particular screen names all the time. And so when I got to DC, I was reading through the city paper and I saw this reading series and I saw one of the screen names. 
It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> I think I'll check this out. So I go in, and I go over and read a haiku, and they're like, oh, you're, you're the haiku dude on, on the website. And I'm like, yeah, this is amazing. And so it was, like, it was almost like all these superheroes, they had all these aliases. And then it's like, well, what's your real name? Well, actually, my name is Derek. Oh, what's your name? My name is Fahim. And what's your name? Oh, my name is Alan. You know, I'm not going to call Alan's screen name out because he'll, he'll show me out. But either way, that's where I got like my, my first taste of, of community. It became uh, just a treat to after my classes to just jump around to different readings. And so going to um, Yogi Records, which was on like every Friday night in Adams Morgan, where I met a lot of people. And then uh, going with Ebony Golden and Venus Thrash to, um, to, uh, to, oh gracious, to uh, the Copper House, or going to um, um, also Mangles as well, or going to like readings up in Baltimore, and going to all these different places. And what was just interesting was I hear all these different names and all these different folks, and they would talk about like almost like a history or a lineage. And so when I, I'm, I love stories and I love listening. So when the opportunity came from me being a, a listener and going to open mics and participating and, and watching how certain hosts kind of like moderated their events or hearing about uh, uh, Ethelbert's series, the Ascension series, and I was like so like dang it, I, you know, I missed it. I felt like right when I got into DC, I, a lot of things were kind of like coming to an end, or at least this wave of things. And so um, as I listened, um, and I checked out how poets how poets performed or how hosts or moderators kind of moderated the event, I said if I ever got a chance to host a series, I wanted to really make it something that, you know, to be selfish, to really fed all the things that, that, that I wanted. So um, the night on the ninth, um, happens every ninth day of the month at 9 p.m. So working for for um, bus boys and poets, especially at the beginning, we were coming up with poems and I poetry ideas and stuff. It's like, what can they, what can we do to bring people in and show them that it's inclusive and that you can hear all sorts of, of poetry? And um, I just looked at how when sometimes hosts would bring a featured poet up, and um, like this night would begin at eight o'clock, and poetry would go on, and the open mic would go on to like like ten or eleven people. People, people still waiting for the feature, and the feature's like, all right, when am I going on? And then maybe like the last forty-five minutes of the evening, then they bring the featured poet on, and by then I felt like the attention of the audience was kind of like, okay, we have gone through this wide array of folks and heard all these styles, and now we get to the person that we want to hear. We don't have much attention left, so. Um, Basically, I decided what the nine on the ninth was. I'm the type of person, and I've always been this way, when it comes to food, you know, food again, I like, uh, I like to eat my dessert first. And so I felt like the feature was, was very much the dessert. And so I decided that whereas most open mics were, you have the list and the feature is kind of in the middle of the list, and they're kind of bookended by two, two rounds of poetry, I just wanted the feature to go first so folks could get the lion's share of the attention. And then also with open mics that I would go to, or readings, you know, the, the, the featured reader would read and the folks would kind of hang out and talk with them for a bit, and then they'd be off to the next place, or off to the next city. And there have been questions that I wanted to ask and all those sorts of things, and I felt like you never got to know the person. So the way the night would go, it generally goes is the feature poet just goes first. They have 20 to 25 minutes to share their poetry and to just you know go all into you know whatever they want to talk about. It's a, I think it's a really great format. But then after that, 20 to 25 minutes, um, I have this thing called the blueprint session where we sit down, and I and I always say I will become like the, the black James Lipton, and I would sit down. We have like an inside the, the writer studio type of discussion, and I get to ask nine like very specific questions about their work and their craft, and then um, even ask them like some general questions that they really have to like think on. And so um, I just really wanted to make sure that people got to see another side of, of the poet or the featured artist. So, you know, once the person leaves, you kind of get this get an idea of who they are before they're on that next bus or that next train. And so you get a chance to kind of uh, just see the person behind the work and the craft. Um, to go even further, um, poetry is also very interactive. And so one thing working working for a place where it's like you have to have people in the seat to make sure people stay and you know, what other, how do you keep a format or a venue fresh? And so um, I love the, um, the Exquisite Corpse. And so I always say, because I 
don't have a hard time spelling exquisite, I would call it the potluck form instead. And so it would be very interactive. So at the beginning of the night, I would hand out the sheet of paper and literally all the folks in the audience who didn't sign up for the open mic or may, maybe not necessarily would get up in front of folks, they would just add a line throughout the night. So by the end of the night, not only have people written a poem, but they also stick around because now they've gotten to write anonymously and they get a chance to actually hear their work read by the host. And so I just love it because you get to some of the wildest like things that, that, that come about. And I love that the anonymity does that. And so by the end of the night, the people are still there. We've already heard as much as we can from the poet. We've learned about who they are and what they're about. The open mic is also going on. And then we get to the end and uh, you know, whereas I had a dessert first, I guess, like at the very end, like I get people like an extra like mint at the end, like here you go, here's the form that um, I want you all to hear that you made. And so hopefully when they leave, they leave knowing that, you know, to a degree they've helped put something together so they're invested in the evening. Um, so I don't know how much that relates to experimentation, but I know as a host and as ideas and as a sponge and being here for 13 years, I do a lot of listening and watching of, of a lot of folks who come before me and even this, this, I love the splendid wake and uh, of, of the idea of um, of archiving and you know keeping traditions alive, but then also kind of like working, working to kind of like mold those to how they fit now in the format. And so I think of all the different types of again <laughs> workshops and places that I've been a part of in D.C. Um, whether it's uh, you know getting a chance to workshop with poets from the Black Rooster, like Ernesto Mercer or. Um, Joel Diaz Porter, um, DJ Renegade, or um, having having the chance to see other writers from the um, the visiting writers series at AU, and then watching the formatting of the Furious Flower um, video that they did back in 2004, and just realizing that I love stories so much that when I pick a feature for the nine on the night, it forces me to do research to find out about that person, to ask the questions that spark a lot of discussion, and maybe even. Um, hold the attention of the audience as well. Um, so I think about just the combination of all these various different things. And yes, it is experimentation, but sometimes it's also about using what's already been left there for you, whether it's um, a legacy or a tradition. And I was thinking about what Tony Medina said um, when I, we used to actually just sit in, in his class um, and just kind of, uh, what, is, what is the word when you don't have to take the class? Oh, we're up on the time. I'm so very sorry, but all I'll say is um, you take tradition and you take form, and then you just kind of learn the rules so you can break them and bend them and make something new. So, thank you. Thank you.